Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome back to the webinar, which uh, has been going on for the past uh, uh, week and a half. Um, we have uh, a special guest today from France, someone who has been in the front lines taking care of uh, COVID patients. Uh, today, um, we have uh, Dr. Fusum Gerwig Xavier, who is a professor of nephrology and head of the Department of Medicine. She's, uh, she lives in Lyon, France. She is a researcher, she is a, a clinician, she is also an educator, covers everything. And number four, she is also a leader leading her group. So, this is what they call quadruple threat because she has the research, a clinician and educator, as well as a leader. Uh, she has uh, over 70 publications with over 100 abstract presentations, national and international. She is uh, going to share with us today um, what she has learned from this uh, um, uh, COVID-19 uh, disaster that's happening across uh, the globe. And uh, without any further delay, um, Dr. Fusum, thank you for coming, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Guma. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well. Okay. So, good afternoon, all. My, so my name is Fitsum Gabriel Xavier. I'm a nephrologist in France, and I will be sharing with you today our COVID-19 preparedness and care for the medical patients, and share also some tips and practical tools from our French experience. The first cases in, on the European continent were confirmed in France on January 24, as we had imported cases in two regions. So the first local cases were diagnosed, uh, diagnosed on February 25. Now, most investigators suggest that the virus was already circulating on January in France. In March 17, as you can see, we had 2,579 hospitalized patients and 699 at the ICU when the government decided to confine the population. You see that afterwards, the cases increased in few weeks with a peak on April 8, where we had 30,375 hospitalized patients and 7,148 ICU patients, which was largely exceeding the usual ICU capacity in France, which was believed to be of around 5,000. So now we believe we are at the plateau uh, phase since at least one week. So when you look at the uh, French map, uh, you can see that the cases are predominantly on the east side of France, the region that we call here the Grand West, which was hit first. So this region, the particularity is that um, it's, uh, it had a religious gathering between February 17 to 24 in Mulhouse, where over 2,000 persons from all over France gathered for almost a week to pray. Many people get contaminated at this event, and it has been the accelerator of the epidemic in France. The second region is Ile-de-France, where we have the capital city, Paris. And the third region is the Auvergne-Rhône-Alpes region that you can see here. I don't know if you can see my, um, my arrow, where I live. On the right side, you see the number of persons admitted at the ICU, and it parallels the number of, of hospitalized patients. We had to increase in few weeks ICU capacity, and that the length of stay at the ICU is longer than usual, and in average, around three to four weeks. ICU capacity is a big challenge while dealing with COVID-19. And this capacity has been overhauled in the first two regions and patients had to be transferred in other regions to the West or countries like Switzerland or um, Germany. So preparedness is also another important key factor while dealing with COVID-19. I would like to share with you how we get prepared and dealt with this uh, epidemic. So you have here the map of France divided into hospital catchment areas. So during preparation, 138 hospitals were identified as referral centers for the treatment of COVID-19. These centers 
at an infectious disease unit, and they were the first units to admit COVID-19 patients, and they were all public hospitals. You can see at Lyon, where I live, the reference hospital was within the Hospice Civil de Lyon, where we have different hospital locations, and two locations were dedicated for the first phase, Croix-Rousse Hospital, where we have the Infectious and Tropical Center, with 50 ICU beds and 150 conventional beds dedicated to adult COVID patients, and Hôpital Mère Enfant, which was dedicated for the pediatric patients. But you can see that other cases increased exponentially and we have to open other locations very quickly in order to increase the ICU and medical capacity everywhere. And finally, we had a coordination by the regional health agencies that created different hubs, which included old medical centers, public and private, in a defined area in order to increase beds and also human and material resources. So you understand from this data that as soon as the virus starts sitting, more and more people will have to rush and reorganize everything in order to create tools, beds, and I want to share with you how we did so. So the first immediate step that we had to take was to reorganize and reallocate beds. At the medical units, in all public and private centers, we canceled in-person visits and limited them to urgent cases. We had to postpone all non-urgent hospitalizations, we replaced them by telemedicine or e-visits or phone calls. This was intended to save human resources and beds to create COVID units and also limit exposure for patients and health workers. In parallel, we postponed non-urgent surgeries and procedures and limited surgeries to urgent cases and cancelled in-person consultations. This helped us to save human resources, reallocate more ventilators to ICU and, and transform OR into ICU. Having a phased strategy to increase the ICU beds is really important. As we had some time compared to other regions or Italy, our anesthesiologists were able to be retrained for critical care patients handling. The second strategy was to limit the exposure of health workers in order to avoid large contamination in all medical centers, COVID or non-COVID centers. We minimized non-essential staffs like students, asking them to stay home, avoided large group rounds and shortened exam lengths and patients' movements. At the same time, visits were restricted for COVID or non-COVID units, and we dedicated non-essential staff to answer phone calls or other staff, for example, preparing protocols. When we consider how we were organized to identify patients, you will see that our knowledge about the virus was changing and increasing we had to adapt our organizations. So these are the symptoms um, that uh, we had as a description of COVID cases and th that were based in the China cases. And the main characteristics of the disease was respiratory signs as well as some systemic signs. And our first questionnaire was based to identify patients was based on these symptoms as well as uh, an amnestic uh, evaluation. In France, it was decided that the main entry for COVID-19 patients would be through a phone call to what we call the SAMU, Service d'Accueil Médical d'Urgence, or some kind of urgent care medical regulator. The population was advised to call a unique number, and based on the severity of their respiratory symptoms, they were referred to the referral hospital if they required hospitalization or asked to consult their GP or stay home when the symptoms were considered minimal. However, the SAMU also treats all the calls from other non-respiratory symptoms that were referred to all other emergencies that were not uh, referral centers. 
Once the patients arrived at the emer emergency PC, um, PCR was performed if COVID was suspected, and they were hospitalized at COVID units if positive and non-COVID units if the PCR was negative. It is during this first phase that we had contaminations of health workers and other patients in locations where we were supposed to treat only non-COVID patients. So we'll see here how this happened. First, as we know now, there are atypical presentations of the disease, specifically in elderly subjects with predominant GI symptoms, neurological signs like confusion or fall, or non-specific symptoms like fatigue. And furthermore, in younger patients, we found headache, anosmia, or cutaneous signs being the only symptoms that uh, for a COVID infection. Second, the diagnosis was based on PCR only, but it has poor sensitivity with 30% of false negativity. And this sensitivity is even lower if the swab is not performed correctly and during the first phase of the disease. So the main message has been to confine clinically suspected cases, even if PCR is negative. Third, so what else do we have to have more specificity? So we know that biology is not helpful if there are no specific biological signs to differentiate from other viral uh, infections. But what about imaging? The other, which is another option. So chest X-ray has also a poor sensitivity, but it can help for initial evaluation and prognosis. So it was advised to perform chest X-ray for those presenting was respiratory sim sim symptoms. And finally, CT scan has high sensitivity but poor specificity. But it can help for diagnosis in one third of patients with negative PCR. So at the end, based on these knowledges, we modified our triage system by adding uh, oh. Um, by adding triage area in all emergency departments with single protected boxes, waiting areas, and depending on the availability of complementary examinations and symptoms, patients will have PCR with or CT scan before being addressed to a COVID or non-COVID unit. The other aspect I wanted to discuss is how we managed COVID units. When creating COVID units, there are a number of things to consider. First, it can last long and you need to be well organized because taking care of COVID patients is time and resource consuming. Taking care of COVID patients can be stressful because of the fear of contamination and all the new information that you need to incorporate. Third, some COVID patients might deteriorate and this can occur with few, within few hours. So there is a need for anticipation in a daily basis. But at the same time, you need to keep in mind that these patients might also suffer from other complications that need to be addressed and treated specifically. And last, not, but not least, for the patients and family members, the disease has a huge emotional impact because patients are isolated, the contact with the family, the medical staff are very limited, and the fear of potential respiratory complication and death is uh, stressful. For these reasons, and as the number of cases increased, we set up medical coordinating teams for the crisis for each hospital. We prepared a list of volunteers with their age and speciality in order to assign tasks based on each one's capacity. We agreed not to post health workers with risk factors and those over 60 years old at front lines in COVID units unless they asked for it in order to minimize their risk of contamination. We doubled the medical resources, planning backups in case we had contaminated personnel. 
a planned organization with peers, one dedicated to patient contact and do examination, and one to do prescriptions and all other tasks like bringing supplies. We dedicated non-essential staff to answer phone calls or other tasks. The main objective for this was to limit ex exposure for health workers, minimize contamination risks, and also save resources like PPE. Uh, the main concern is the risk of health workers contamination. We made an exhaustive list of procedures at risk and requiring airborne protection that you will find on the left. And these were based on the PCR positivity of pe specimens. And of not, uh, COVID-19 is detectable until death and specific handling of the dead have been implemented in the, our institutions. So that everyone can have access to the precautions, visual representations were disseminated in all units. This is an example that I translated with slight modifications and that I wanted to share with you. However, I had to admit that due to the scarcity, uh, scarcity of resources, we had to make significant modifications on these recommendations. And I think that it's better that we discuss about it later if you want to. As I said previously, the clinical conditions of the patients can deteriorate quickly and the possible scarcity of ICU beds, advanced care planning will need to be discussed for every patient, COVID or non-COVID, on a daily basis. We set up institutional level of care ethic committee. And here is the example that we used in Lyon at Hospice Civil de Lyon. We set up four levels of care. Level one for maximal treatment was transferred to ICU without condition and limitations and level four at the extreme, which is palliative care. In between, the level two was to transfer to ICU, but discuss limitations with intensivists if required. And level three was not to transfer to ICU, but give maximum medical care without resuscitations. Of course, this is a personalized prescription, not solely based on age, with when possible shared decision with staff members and patients, traced in the medical files and re-evaluated on a daily basis, depending on the medical conditions of the patients. You can find here the advanced care planning tool that we used. It included information on the day of hospitalizations, initial cause of hospitalizations, the medical history with comorbid conditions, the number of treatments and immunosuppression, and the general condition of the patients. It takes into account the evolution of the patient, the level of information that was given to the patient, and the preferences of the patients. There are key questions to help in the decision making that were the acute condition reversible in the short term, is there an underlying short-term uncurable fatal condition? Did the active treatment improve the condition? Will the further autonomy or quality of life will be limited? Is there a major risk of being dependent on supportive treatment? And finally, did the patient express his opposition to invasive treatment in order to comply with his will? Now, the process of opening new units was moving quickly we made up checklists with mandatory actions. So for the checklist to work efficiently, we designated reference persons with written protocols for every task. This is a list of the to-do lists when opening a COVID unit that was set up. It includes hygiene, PPE, equipment, laundry, waste management, biocleaning, that biocleaning, disinfection of equipments and environments, pharmacy with a list of essential treatments, cadaver handling, support for the team, infectious disease, ICU, and palliative care, reference persons, and protocols, and hotline numbers in order to facilitate the work of the teams. 
I'll take a few minutes to present how we monitored and treated patients. This is a schematic representation for the escalate, escalating phases of disease progression with COVID-19. With associated signs, symptoms, and potential phases, specific therapies. A minority of COVID-19 patients will transition into the third and most severe stage of illness, which manifests as an extrapulmonary systemic hyperinflammation syndrome. The crucial moment where this complication can happen is the day seven to day 10, or a little bit later for immunocompromised patients. So it is important to trace the day one or first symptoms. For non-complicated patients, as the number of patients is increasing quickly, the indication for hospitalization was, was based on risk factors of severe form of COVID-19. And this has been based on the paper that were published on the first cases in China. We included certain Mr. pregnant women because of the requirement of obstetrical evaluation. And as we have a social health system uh, uh, in France, patients with some ambulatory monitoring is impossible were hospitalized in order to give them equal treatment because most of these patients were um, uh, from uh, homeless or with uh, unfavorable social condition. Hospitalized patients with respiratory symptoms will need, were um, monitored closely for signs of clinical deterioration, such as rapid progressive respiratory failure and sepsis, and supportive care interventions were applied immediately if necessary. For this is reason, all areas where patients are cared for were equipped with pulse oximeter, functioning oxygen system, and oxygen delivering interfaces. As the deterioration can be fast, we were advised to discuss transfer to ICU what are timely when respiratory rates was above 30 per minute, or oxygen requirement was above five liters per minute to maintain saturation over 90%, or if there is associated organ failure. As you all know, as for today, there is no treatment, specific treatment that has been approved to treat COVID-19. The standard of care is the symptomatic treatment with few things to have in mind. Patients should be treated cautiously with intravenous fluids because aggressive fluid resuscitation may worsen oxygenation, especially in settings when there is limited availability of mechanical ventilation. Second, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are contraindicated to treat fever or pain for COVID patients are the severe forms that were observed in young patients in France were among those who auto-medicated themselves with NSAID. And lastly, there is high incidence of thromboembolic complications requiring systematic prevention with low molecular weight heparin with increased doses for those who have um, hyper, uh, acute hyperinflammatory uh, syndromes. So I'd like to share with you the um, algorithms that we used for antiviral or anti-immunomodulatory uh, treatments. Just keep in mind, the area of treatment for COVID is something that moves fast. What we may discuss today may change tomorrow and will need to be revised. Uh, there is no specifically approved treatment. Uh, for COVID-19. The, the attitude in France was to include the patients on ongoing clinical trials as much as we can. In fact, we included most patients in the discovery trial, which is a five arms clinical trial, uh, on, on, for, and other clinical trials. And for those who did not meet inclusion criteria and who were within the first 10 days after symptoms, and with clinical signs of pneumonia 
and oxygen requirements, or clinical or scanographic signs that were compatible with COVID and with risk factors with, of severe forms of COVID-19, and if there was no interaction of the patient's treatments with the lopinavir, ritonavir, or, hyd or hydroxychloroquine treatments, we could, we could start first lopinavir, ritonavir treatments, if no contraindication. This decision was to be applied after staffing, and the treatment was applied for 14 days. If the antiviral treatment was contraindicated, then the second option was hydroxychloroquine after checking QT with the EKG, potassium, and stopping a um, potential treatment affecting uh, Q QT. And the patients were um, monitored with EKG, blood glucose, potassium, and magnesium. If we look at the um, algorithm for immunomodulations, uh, similar to the first algorithm, we had to check first possible inclusion for clinical trial. Middle modulating treatment was not advised before day seven after first symptoms. The indication was discussed for patients requiring more than three liters per minute oxygen to maintain saturation over 94% associated with major inflammatory syndrome and increased oxygen requirement within 24 hours. And after excluding heart failure, pulmonary embolism, or other pathogen-related infections, and confirming compatible pulmonary bilateral lesions. The treatment was, was proposed with the associations of antiviral first or hydroxychloroquine uh, if contraindicated that we discussed in the previous slide, associated with corticosteroids. The doses were divided, of corticosteroids were divided by two patients were on lepanavir and roitonavir, and corticosteroids were associated with precautions that were prophylactic parasite drug uh, treatments if uh, patients were, living, uh, were coming from or are living in areas at risk, and prophylactic antibiotic like ceftriaxone or cefepim for uh, patients at risk of infection with um, uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So the, I think this is, would be the last slide. Um, I just put uh, one slide uh, to give you the score, uh, performance status and frailty scores that we used. Um, and I want to thank you to, uh, to listen for my uh, presentation and uh, uh, hopefully, we don't have to go through this in Ethiopia. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fitzson. This is just an outstanding presentation. I think you covered um, you covered almost every phase of the problem, and um, and I think um, the message was very clear. Um, you, I think, you prepared everybody for uh, if this comes, it's uh, going to be a very long battle. It is draining and stressful, not only for the physicians, but also for the family members and everybody involved in this. Um, and, and you emphasize a lot on the strategies of protection, both for the physicians and non-physicians working in the healthcare environment. And I think something that's really important that you mentioned is the advanced care planning, um, particularly for those elderly patients with comorbidities, what to do and how to uh, help them through. So, so I think a lot of this is covered and uh, there are questions coming. So let's start with the first one is, um, you know, what do you think about um, healthcare workers working in the COVID unit um, going home, do you send them home every day? Do they stay away from home? So what was the strategy there that's used to protect them 
from uh, contaminating others when they go home or in the community. Okay, here in France, we didn't have the strategy to t tell them to not to go back home. So we, or, or me also, <laughs> I was going back home. <laughs> Uh, no, there was no strategy confining uh, or uh, telling uh, health workers not to go back to their house. But we were advised when we were working, we, don't, we took out all our clothes, you know, um, and changing everything and uh, doing the same before going back home. Uh, we didn't have, uh, as much as they know, contaminations by this, uh, by well, confirmed con family contamination related to uh, health workers at work. Yeah. So, so the next question I see here is, you know, about, um, you know, what is the minimum PPE you need while treating these patients? <laughs> oh, okay. So it depends on how many beds you have, also how many patients that you have, actually. Um, we were asked, for example, uh, when we started, we, patients were on single, in single rooms and we had to um, close the doors. And we were supposed to change PPE bet in between patients. And you can understand how very quickly we were out of PPE. So that's why working by pair that I, I was uh, mentioning was important. The one who, uh, uh, who enters when you work in COVID units, supposedly you have COVID patients. So there was one who was um, working in the clean area and another person would be going from one room to another room or from one patient to the other patient. We were not changing all the PPE. We were changing the plastic apron, uh, doing hand hygiene and changing gloves in between patients in order to save the, uh, our equipment. And so that equipment is particularly the um, N95 kind of mask, I think, I would assume, that you're changing your apron, you're changing your glove, and you're washing your hands. Yes. Okay. And did you have always a And then clean, uh, you know, uh, do the cleaning of all the equipments we bought inside in between, so that we do not, we did not contaminate ourselves. So one other question is about um, levermectin um, treatment. Uh, you know, it says, is it possible to use levermectin for the treatment of COVID-19 patients? Have you guys used it? Oh, no. So we used it as prophylaxis. Uh, you know, when you, we use uh, corticosteroids here, I don't know in America if you do so, but if you have patients that come from uh, area at risk, we we systematically give this treatment, but I don't. We don't. We didn't use it as a treatment for COVID. And um, uh, what do you think about reinfections? Because people are now saying, at least some reports are coming, particularly from China, that as if uh, those patients who were negative. Uh, becoming positive again and worries about reinfection with this virus. Is that a phenomenon that um, uh, you have um, noticed or tested or is it possible? No, so we, I don't think that in France we have enough, you know, so as, as I mentioned, the, you know, it's all started in March. So I don't think that we have enough, uh, you know, uh, distance since the start of the epidemic to have this kind of statements. I read about the uh, Korea, also Korean studies where they are saying that um, they, they were people that were positive and had the infection before, but they're not giving precisions about their symptoms. Uh, here, what we know is that when you do serological testing, some uh, patients, like less than 15%, would not have um, the, the, the antibodies, uh, titers that would be protective. But we don't, we don't know if it's still um, an indication that 
they might have a second infection. I see, I see. So, so is that uh, after an appropriate length of time? I mean, so patients who had basically what infected, recovered, and, and serology is negative, is that what you mean? Yes, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, um, another question is, you know, what the length of your typical shift in COVID units? Um, how many hours and you know, how do you organize the teams? Um, how do okay. you decide who should serve and, and uh, how many people do you basically include in a shift and for how many hours? Okay, so what I, we try to do, uh, we are so many volunteers um, and to prevent the exhaustion um, of um, the staffs, we uh, try to have two, one senior and one, uh, one intern for eight patients for the doctors. And we try to make them work five days or six, but at least have one or two days off where they would stay at home, not uh, you know do what they, what they, whatever they wanted, uh, because it's really stressful, you know it's emotionally, um, and uh, we don't want to have what the Chinese are describing burnouts and so on. So we, we try to as much as possible to uh, help. Uh, and um, we had a big solidarity between doctors to go and work in there in these units actually. Yeah, this actually mirrors to what I have also been uh, saying, um, you know, uh, about, about our institution here. Uh, it is really more initially volunteer based who wants mm -hmm. to really do this uh, of course if there are no volunteers then you know the leadership has to come up with a with a plan to yes. make this mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. um, and we take uh, here we take about five days uh, five days each um, the volunteers there is a, always an attending and um, and uh, uh, probably one or two residents and uh, and the ratio you described is also how it looks like. Uh, here we have at least 10 ICU patients uh, per mm -hmm. team. So that is how, um, at least in surgery, uh, critical care, because our critical care is becoming part of the, um, the COVID unit. Uh, that's how we are planning. David, is there anything to add from your uh, medicine uh, perspective, internal medicine? No, exactly what you said, every five days, uh, one thing that we have done, uh, and I'm sure it is available for you also, I'm sure, Durma, is uh, we have uh, hotels reserved for medical professionals if they don't want to go to their home. So they stay for that five day uh, in the hotel so uh, to decrease uh, this uh, uh, potential transmission. And in Ethiopia also, uh, because we are learning as we go, uh, one of the things that I'm always asking the medical professionals there is to come up with uh, a, a rotation plan um, mm -hmm. like a two weeks rotation especially if the epidemic hits at really hard uh, for two weeks maybe you can reserve a hotel for physicians a specific uh, um, transportation system so that they would not be uh, mixed with the publics and uh, things like that to decrease uh, transmission yeah no thank you uh, and i know um, some uh, dorm rooms also at the university have been prepared for this purpose, but it has been so far voluntary. So it's not like you have to, be, to isolate yourself. Um, you know, as long as you have used your protection equipment appropriately, uh, you take a nice shower before you leave the hospital and change into your, um, your clean clothes before you leave, uh, people have actually been going home. Um, some additional question with medications with regards to azithromycin's role and um, recommendations uh, or use of steroids um, in endohydrochloroquine in countries like Ethiopia. What are your thoughts? Um, you know, I know every country has different protocols for different yes. reasons, um, <laughs> and and I know. Uh, 
you know, the French experience started this uh, hydrochloroquine issue, and uh, yes. <laughs> and our our um, administration is actually pushing that also through. What do you think about that in in, in the Ethiopian context? From what you know, well, the hydroxychloroquine, you know, yeah, you know, it's uh, one of our doctors. <laughs> who uh, published uh, all this data on hydroxychloroquine and um, azithromycin. Uh, the problem is that for, an, for the moment, I, we don't have any randomized and you know, proven data to, uh, to, to apply it systematically. The problem that we had here, uh, when we started, we tried to do the protocol as per um, Professor Raoult's uh, recommendations, which was hydroxychloroquine and uh, um, azithromycin. And we had cardiac complications. So we stopped adding um, uh, azithromycin on top of hydroxychloroquine. For steroid, okay. for steroid treatments, the main thing is do not give it on patients who are starting who are on the who are on the first phase of the infection because it's the viral phase and it will be really on patients who would have oxygen requirement deteriorating fastly in order to avoid intubation for the moment we are very you know we, we try to to give it only for these conditions but so far we are uh, analyzing retrospectively the data that we have, because we had the impression, impression that it was work, working good. So, 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 so what you just said here now, just to paraphrase you about the steroids, basically do not start it early. Um, just uh, this is going to be like almost a last ditch effort and it's uh, probably in the latter phases of the disease. And there is really no study at this point to confirm uh, if this is even useful. Is that, is that, did I paraphrase you okay? Yes, yes. There are ongoing trials. Hopefully, since things are going so fast, maybe, I don't know, if, if it's in within one month, I think we'd have results from many randomized trials, actually. Dao, did you want to add something? And you can maybe cover also a little bit the azithromycin and also some of the anti, uh, you know, viral stuff, particularly uh, levermectin used as a prophylaxis. I think Dr. Fitzum said that's probably where it's being used right now. No, I was actually going to ask Dr. Wondosan if he is here to comment on that because he is on the guideline writing committee for Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Health. Uh, with the absence of data, obviously, as you know, as Fusum has uh, said it very clearly, has to come up with a guideline, and they have wrote the guideline uh, where Dr. Rondosan was a big part of it. Uh, and I was looking at it actually yesterday, and exactly for Ethiopian purposes, hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine as an interchangeable are going to be the first line of treatment. And from what I'm hearing in the Ministry of Health area, they have a reasonable amount of stuff uh, for chloroquine. So. So that might be probably the medications that would be to go with azithromycin. I mean, exactly as Fusum said, uh, there is very little to go around in terms of evidence, randomized mm. control trial. Uh, mm. The data was from France, a very well-known uh, scientist in Marseille is the one who gave us this information and now it is being challenged continuously. Uh, the recent yes. one being the paper that was published in New England Journal of Medicine, a, a yes. small randomized controlled trial to mm. look at hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, and the result was negative. But mm. in the absence of alternate treatment, still we are giving it. In our hospital, hydroxychloroquine is the first line treatment uh, followed by antivirals. The same thing, the antiretrovirals, plausible in terms of uh, mechanism of action because this is a virus uh, you can inhibit it is replication capacity with antiviral medications uh, where it is the uh, uh, com basically compassionate use now on study of redemsevir or yes. uh, lopinavir which is calitra uh, but still again uh, it all they all need randomized controlled trials and i don't think we're going to get them when dosen are you there 
Maybe not. So can you both comment on um, serum administration um, for patients, if at all? When do you do that? Have you done that, uh, Dr. Fitzgerald? No, but we, well, we uh, have started from, there are three centers in France who have started the protocol with plasma therapy, uh, but uh, nephrology patients are not concerned by this. Based on the, the previous publication from, um, from the ch uh, Chinese publications, so plasma therapy, but in severe forms also. I mean, the, any additional the, the, science, the, the science and the theory is plausible. It's not uh, the first uh, disease that we are treating with plasma. It is basically yes. uh, bringing antibodies from a person who has been previously infected. We are actually one of the sites. We are starting to collect now plasma from prior infected individuals. We are asking people who think that they had symptoms or who have been diagnosed to come in. The biggest challenge is you don't even know if this antibody is protective, uh, because I was hearing that you were talking about uh, yeah. what does that mean in terms of reinfection and things like yeah. that, because mm -hmm. you don't know exactly what the cutoff is in terms of protection. For example, in mm -hmm. uh, hepatitis B, if you see, uh, not everybody who has antibody means that they are protected. Uh, it has mm -hmm. to be above 10 million international units per ml for you mm -hmm. to be uh, protected. So if you have eight or you have seven, you know that you have been exposed but you, you're not protected, so you have to be revaccinated again. So mm -hmm. since this is a new disease, we don't have that kind of reference frame. So mm -hmm. as we go, as we collect this plasma, we're going to have some kind of data. I'm sure by the time, uh, hopefully it won't be a big epidemic in Ethiopia, but if it happens, uh, it would be months ahead of us. So by that time, we might have some data. But at this time, basically it is plasma pheresis, basically you take antibodies, uh, you basically concentrate them and you're trying to give them in hope that uh, for the life of the antibody, uh, that person will be protected. It is not going to be a long-term uh, protection. Do we even know if uh, the antibody responses, you know, be it, you know, the IgG or the IgM responses, how long does it take? Yeah. Is that being even measured? Um, you know, at certain intervals, and is there any difference? Uh, should it be showing up by 14 days? Is it 21 days? Is there anything as such in medicine that is looking into that about the antibody response? Uh, well, from my Go point, ahead. I, I, yeah, well, I think that it's really premature to, to have all these conclusions because theoretical tests are, you know, they are per, uh, testing and then trying to have perfect surgical tests. So for now on, why isn't standardized? It's because they are not very sure of what they are testing here in France, actually. They are still uh, trying to, te to have better tests, serological tests. And so one additional question from prophylaxis perspective, uh, somebody here typed in uh, Suad, as uh, mentions uh, chloroquine and zinc for prophylaxis only is being mentioned. Um, any thoughts on that? Oh, sorry. Any thoughts on prophylaxis for prophylaxis given chloroquine and, um, and zinc? Is that something? Prophylactic uh, treatment for COVID? Yes. Oh, no, here, well, uh, I have, there are, uh, well, uh, to my knowledge, there are no studies because here in France, we consider that uh, COVID, most patients will have non-symptomatic or we don't, will not have severe forms. So there is no reason to give prophylactic treatments. That's what they say. But uh, I don't know if it's a wrong uh, thing or not. So uh, this is so, a, a, an area that is being studied actively, but the issues are two. Uh, one is for how long do you give? So there are two ways. Uh, one is just for the full duration of uh, uh, risk, people will take the prophylaxis, and the other one is for hydroxychloroquine, basically just to give it to uh, for uh, uh, basically three days or so post exposure. That will not be sustainable because. Every, if, somebody, if somebody is a medical professional, 
and they are the ones who are at high risk, there will be a continuous exposure. And uh, the only plausible answer will be is sustained continuous prophylaxis for the duration of the epidemics, basically. And that will drain the most meager resource of chlorophyll that you have for an uh, indication that is not even uh, sure. Uh, so studies have to come. I mean, we don't have all the answers, but these are all questions that are very, very relevant. Indirectly, we have patients, lupus patients, who are taking the treatment uh, all the time. So we can see if there are more in, uh, uh, cases in lupus patients, severe cases. Yeah, so Dr. Fitzum, I just want to maybe in the next minute or two to elaborate on something really, really important that people should hear about, which is the advanced care planning. So, which, you know, I know you had to do it quickly, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, the advanced care planning is nothing else but, you know, how do we decide who goes into a comfort care or how do we decide into when to stop treatment. And you know, this is a complex issue. So um, could you just walk us through the process, you know, from, from the moment the person comes in, who, how do, we, do you identify who to talk to? Or do most elderly people have some decisions that uh, they have made ahead of time about CPR, about you know, how they want to be treated if they have a life-threatening situation? So can you just walk us, is there an ethics group or committee, or is it the treating physician who talks to the patient? How, how about if the patient cannot talk? Do you involve the family? So yes. how does that work? So mainly, uh, that's why we are saying we, we need to do it for every patient now. So advocate planning should be done in, even though we didn't have the epidemic. But you know how it is, we, uh, we, not, we don't set level of care for every patient that we see. But with the epidemic, we, set, we decided that would, it would be, should be applied to all patients because a non-COVID patient will be at the hospital and have a complication uh, with uh, COVID infection, actually. So we, when we discuss, if the dis patient uh, can discuss with us, it, will, it is... Uh, the, um, the, the care planning is discussed with the patient and the patient's preference. Uh, if he cannot, it will be a discussion also with the family. It's not one physician deciding. It can be, uh, it should be always be a team with nurses and doctors. And if we are not comfortable with the decision, we not come up with a decision, we will uh, call for the uh, palliative care uh, team who would help for, you know, to, to, for the reflection and what is more important and not for the team. Um, the problem is that in France, uh, where I live, we were able to have this set up. Uh, in the east of France, uh, they didn't have because, uh, you know, the uh, ICU capacity was overwhelmed, so they had to make um, very difficult decisions based on age and you know it's it was really hard that's why we said we need to set it up before and you know decide daily um, before we had to to choose which one to save and not to save well this is um, this is definitely one of the most complicated decisions uh, to make and having um, the patients have a say in that decision from the get-go is really, really very important. And I think uh, this is um, um, something um, different for Ethiopian context. So there is uh, a lot to think about and maybe the hospitals and the groups with their ethics uh, um, you know, units may have to really come up with a protocol. And, and so everybody please rest assured that uh, all these slides uh, will be shared with you uh, and will be sent with the next uh, invitation to the next talk. The next talk tomorrow is uh, going to be on multi-organ system failure in the critical care unit. Um, and it's going to be given by Dr. Elias uh, Ashame, who you all have met uh, last week. Um, 
and that will be tomorrow. And then on on um, on Friday, we're going to tackle cardiac complications and uh, particularly review a little bit arrhythmias because I think um, those are the things that can occur, particularly with the hydroxychloroquine treatment, as well as uh, just in general in some of these elderly patients. So we have multi-organ system failure tomorrow and uh, cardiac complications the day after tomorrow. So one last question, Dr. Fritzun, for you is, you know, um, anticoagulation. Um, mm. So we hear there is a, a lot of vascular related or you know thrombosis issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, could you tell us your strategy? Do people go home on some anticoagulation, uh, those PE patients? So how, so tell us a little bit how, what you experienced. So what we did, you know that the first local French patients uh, with COVID infection died from pulmonary embolism. At that time, people were saying uh, it's, he died because he had a comorbid condition because we didn't know that uh, it was related to the disease. Uh, when you have, um, I have a legist in, uh, in our group and when he performs autopsy and he says the, 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 you know, the lesions are mostly vascular lesions, uh, pulmonary vascular lesions with microtrombi. Uh, and so it's a vascular disease actually when it is on the uh, um, uh, acute respiratory syndrome. So here, uh, what we do is all the patients who would get hospitalized with COVID infection will have prevention. And the doses was low molecular weight heparin because they would be resistant to, um, uh, to um, uh, sodic heparin. And increase the doses of the treatment if there is an inflammatory uh, state. So this is the general strategy uh, and increase doses if uh, the patient is obese uh, also. Yeah, thank you, it's very clear. And um, uh, any of my other um, presenters from the past have any comment? I see Rahel, you are on the line. Do you have any additional thoughts or comments? Hi. Hello, everybody. That was such a wonderful talk, Fitzum. Um, hey, um, hi. <laughs> I know you've been through this, and uh, it's nice to hear somebody who's kind of gone through it and, you know, plateauing now, and us being able to hear even from you here in the States. So thank you for presenting. Oh. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I was going to I guess what I wanted to, I care a lot right now about Ethiopia and about since they're at the very beginning of the phase and the infection control. And I did hear you talking a little bit about um, how difficult it is for families. Mm -hmm. So one thing I wanted to touch, did you guys completely limit the visitors all the way, 100%? Well, um, yeah, unless, that, that's what I, I, I put it on my slide, but I didn't comment on that, unless it's end of life, because there is a lot of suffering about this. And uh, so we, we started to, to have one visitor per day for those who are, are on um, uh, end of life care. So they can see someone. And you would put them in full PPE? Yes. Okay. The, right, the main problem, you know, like to admit, if you say we, have, we, we admit more visitors, we have no PPE also to give to all visitors. Mm -hmm. So, but um, so we had to say one visitor because it's you know it's our humanity that was touched because of uh, the families. So we're really, really, really sad about this. Okay, very good. I just wanted to make sure we're doing the same thing here. We're doing really no no visitors at all, which is hard. But um, with our technology, at least that they can see each other on Facetime and things like this. And yeah, I mentioned so we, it in my we're giving it. Yeah, we're bringing, um, you know, iPads and so on, uh, so, um, uh, so that they can see them, the, their family. But it's not the same thing as having them, you know, next to you, near you. It's, uh, and these are elderly patients, they're not used to screens. Yeah, <laughs> I understand. Well, thank you for what you do. I think that was an excellent presentation. And any additional um, um, presenters who may want to provide any additional thoughts? Well, if, if Omar, not, I think, this is, yes. This is Elias. I just want to say a couple of things. Yes. Um, 
Uh, it was an ex excellent presentation, uh, Dr. Fusum. Thank you for sharing your experience. Uh, and so, you know, she talked about um, limiting treatment uh, during the advanced care planning, which is going to be very important, especially in Ethiopian cases. You know, age, for example, what I, I can see, I mean, in Ethiopia, the main issue is going to be, I think, uh, uh, resource uh, scarcity, especially ICU beds. So I think the question is going to be who you're going to admit to ICU or not. I think that 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 need to be well thought of ahead of plan. You have to have, like Dr. Fitzum, uh, try to present some kind of criteria. Since Ethiopia is uh, similar to France in social medicine, we you can't do that here. Here, you can do it per hospital. Now, in, in America, you know, I mean, we, we can't, you can't do, you can't, it's not social medicine, so you can't have uh, one blanket. But what we do here, for example, uh, ECMO, that we have age limit to use ECMO, right? For example, if you are older than 60 and with underlying conditions, blah, blah, you, you, you can't even consider this kind of extraordinary treatment, right? So I think we, Ethiopia, I think what I can see is they probably have to think about who to use their ICUs uh, from the get-go. So I think that advanced care planning is gonna be very important in that aspect. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for those uh, thoughts and comments. And I think, uh, um, I think um, uh, these slides uh, will probably um, provide a lot more additional information. And as also, uh, as usual, we are going to put this presentation online after editing it. Uh, I think um, the first presentation has been shared on uh, the Ethiopian American Doctors Group Facebook. Uh, it's going to be also uh, pretty soon on our, on our website. Uh, I really want to urge everybody to look at the um, presentation, I mean, uh, the link that was sent to you for the survey, Monkey, and uh, please put in your names and your email addresses. The reason that's important is because we want to tighten up who we send invitations and uh, which emails are working. So please uh, send us your, uh, your information on the survey uh, link that we sent you. Um, with that, I think um, our time is up and uh, I really, really appreciate uh, Dr. Futu for this wonderful presentation. Thank you, uh, Malaku, as usual for organizing and uh, working in the background. So thank you so much for attending again today and have a great day. Bye.